Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am so pleased that you all did not let the rain and wind stop you from coming out. I am Caprice Jennerson, the president and attorney in charge of the Office of the Appellate Defender, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 29th annual uh, First Monday in October Gala and Mock Supreme Court Argument. So this event is our time to celebrate uh, the OAD community. And what we mean by community is all of our current staff members, our alumni, our board members, our clients, community-based organizations with whom we partner, the judiciary, and of course, all of you. Your support and generosity enable us to increase capacity and think creatively about how we can confront the barriers to equal access to justice that our clients face every single day. I am so pleased to share with you that your charitable giving for tonight has reached a record-breaking level of more than $637,000. Now that deserves applause. As most of you know, OAD became the city's sec second institutional indigent defense provider in 1988. And then there was a real dire need to increase the number of skilled attorneys to represent individuals on direct appeal, to alleviate an extreme backlog pending in the first department. Thousands of appeals went unperfected because there simply weren't enough qualified lawyers to handle them. And so our primary mission was, and still is today, to represent people who cannot afford legal representation on direct appeal of their felony convictions. But OAD has done so much more than meet the basic mandate. We have undertaken a much loftier goal to center our clients in our representation and to challenge not only the specific legal issues presented in each case, but also the systemic issues that plague the criminal legal system. Today, there is still a need to increase the number of qualified attorneys as well as other advocates, such as social workers, paralegals, investigators, and mitigation specialists. The unrelenting systemic issues of overcriminalization, overpolicing, mass incarceration, excessive sentencing, and wrongful convictions which disproportionately burden people of color, requires that we continue to recruit and train advocates 
from various races and ethnicities, lived experiences, and broad perspectives. A cornerstone of OAD's identity and mission to improve the quality of indigent defense in New York City and nationwide is deeply rooted in our training. We intensively train staff attorneys in a three-year term-limited fellowship. We maintain a criminal appellate defender clinic at NYU Law School. We work with numerous associates at New York City law firms through our volunteer appellate defender program. We receive one or two associates each year through Cleary Gottlieb's fellowship program, which allows the associate to embed in OAD as staff attorneys for a full year. Lawyers are trained at OAD, continue their careers beyond our walls. Some have become chief state and federal defenders. Others have become law professors and philanthropists. Others are law firm, prop, uh, law firm partners, members of the judiciary, and even some of our alumni have joined the efforts to reform prosecutors' offices. Through its commitment to training, OAD's reach far exceeds its walls and plays an influential role in the administration of criminal justice throughout the country. OAD attorneys, VAT attorneys, Cleary Fellows, NYU Clinic students had a, num a number of successes over the past year. And I could really read a really long list to you, but I'm only going to highlight maybe three. So Stephen Struther and, T and Tabitha Cohen represented clients who were resentenced because the trial court failed to consider youthful offenders, offender status, much like tonight's Beacon of Hope honoree. Victorian Wu successfully argued a 440 motion in the Bronx Supreme Court, which resulted in the vacatur of the a client's conviction because the district attorney failed to disclose evidence of third party culpability. And due to the efforts of Alexandra Valdez and other former staff attorneys, a client's uh, drug sale conviction was vacated because of her status as a victim of trafficking at the time of the offense. As I said, I could really go on and on all night. I could spend the rest of the night singing, singing the praises of the most amazing colleagues that I have the pleasure of working with every day. We are so grateful for your incredible support, which enables us to ensure that we can continue these kinds of successes and deepen our commitment to the pursuit of equal access to justice. So with that said, I have quite a few thank yous. You're going to have to bear with me. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce the stars of OAD's 29th annual Mock Supreme Court argument. Our advocates and recipients of the Gould Award for Outstanding Oral Advocacy, James Benjamin Jr. of Aiken Gump. <laughs> Anthony Rico of the Federal Defense Penalty Resource Council. Our Chief Justice and recipient of the Council for Justice Award, Catherine Rumler, General Counsel of Goldman Sachs, and our mock Supreme Court justices who are seated before you, Teresa Trascoma, Joan Lochnain, Andrew Goldstein, Robert Boone, Gabrielle Freeman, Amanda Kramer, Daniel Stein, and Ronald White. You will soon meet our Beacon of Hope Award recipient, Ezekiel Ochoa, and our Gideon Award recipient, Wachtel, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. So I really want to thank all of you for participating in this e evening's event and supporting the work of OAD. Thank you so much. So I want to circle back and again thank my colleagues, those who are in attendance in the room and I see your faces and those who could not join us tonight. I am such in awe of who you are and such in awe of the hard work that you do every day on behalf of our clients. To our host committee, Nick Borton, Sean Hecker, Antonia Apps, Tatiana Martins, Elizabeth Grayer, Jeff Udell, and Lisa Zornberg, thank you so much for the eight o'clock meetings and the many emails over the past five months.
And to the full board of directors, directors, thank you so much for your support and your outreach that have really made this event a marvelous success. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Appellate, Advocate, Appellate Innovations for the beautiful journals, which I hope are at each of your seats, and our honorary chair and first Monday court crier for the past 28 years, Myrna Felder. I'd also just like to take a moment to remember the late Roar Reardon, who was a board member for over 30 years and a true champion of OAD, and also served as an honorary co-chair for this event alongside Myrna for many years. So again, I thank all of you for your generous support. So the, just a bit of logistics. Before the actual argument, I am pleased to present the first two awards of the night. The Beacon, of, the Beacon of Hope Award and the Gideon Award. And then following the, arc, the argument, OAD's board chair, Nick Borton, and board member, Sean Hecker, will present the Gould Awards and the Council for Justice Award. So the Beacon of Hope. I am both humbled and so proud to present the Beacon of Hope Award to Ezekiel Ochoa. This award celebrates a former client whose life stands as a powerful example of the capacity that people have for change and highlights the, um, highlights the importance of fair sentencing that takes into consideration all the factors relevant to rehabilitation. Ezekiel was a child when he was taken from his mother's care and without parental guidance, he followed friends and, and other family members into gang activity. Ezekiel was arrested with 13 other children, teenagers, and he was charged with gang-related activities. Ezekiel's arrest for him was a wake-up call. And while awaiting trial at Rikers, he took enormous steps towards education and self-improvement. He ultimately pled guilty to possessing a gun. But the prosecutor in the case refused to offer anything lower than a six-year sentence. Furthermore, the trial judge ruled that Ezekiel was not presumptively eligible for youth, youthful offender status. Under New York law, youthful offender status is granted at sentencing in the interest of justice and is meant to relieve an eligible youth from the onus of having a criminal record. One who is sentenced as a youthful offender will have the records automatically sealed. But the trial judge in Ezekiel's case believed that weapons possession made him ineligible. On appeal, OAD alumni Cami Lizarraga, who is here this evening, challenged the court's failure to adjudicate Ezekiel as a youthful offender, and she prevailed. Yet while awaiting his appeal and resentencing, Ezekiel had to survive what so many of our clients have to survive, the violence and trauma of prison. He was fortunate to have the love and support of his family, he married his wife, Jarlene, who is by his side tonight while he was incarcerated, and his family talked with him frequently and visited him very frequently. And for that reason, he was able to remain focused through the connections with his wife and family and his then two-year-old daughter, as well as his mother and other family members. Upon remand, the same trial judge that sentenced Ezekiel was ready to retire, but he stayed on to resentence Mr. Ochoa. After hearing Ezekiel's story, the judge said that while, while people often leave prison worse off, he was so impressed that Ezekiel made steps towards improving himself and success. The judge announced how proud he was and that he was glad that Ezekiel's case would be the last sentence that he issued. And then he imposed the youthful offender designation. Ezekiel no longer has that conviction on his record. And he's here today as a young man who, not just a young man, I should say a husband and a father, who has demonstrated through strength and perseverance what it looks like to fall down and to get back up again. So please join me in congratulating Ezekiel Ochoa.
guys. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate this award. Thank you, Cam, so much for your help. My wife, Charlene, thank you so much. I really don't got too much to say. It's my first time ever doing something like this. So I appreciate all y'all coming. So now on to the Gideon Award. Since 2018, OAD has awarded the Gideon Award to a law firm that has demonstrated an exemplary commitment to indigent appellate defense through participation in OAD's Volunteer Appellate Defender, Defender VAD program. Attorneys at participating law firms get valuable hands-on experience on all aspects of the criminal appeal, from issue selection to oral argument, all under the direct supervision of OAD's uh, supervising attorney. Most importantly, OAD's clients receive the support of dedicated associates and partners through the VAD program. This year, we are pleased to present the Gideon Award to Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Wachtell has been a dedicated supporter of the VAD program for at least two decades. Wachtell's attorneys work with OAD's supervisors um, have represented no fewer than 17 clients. They've drafted extensive legal briefs and presented compelling arguments to the appellate division. Wachtell attorneys have raised substantive arguments on complex Fourth Amendment search and seizure issues. They've challenged the weight and sufficiency of the evidence. Uh, they've raised claims of ineffective assistance of trial, calendar, trial counsel and challenged the prosecution's use of peremptory strikes. Wachtell has also been a steadfast supporter of OAD's First Monday and has represented many times in the event over the years, most recently by Sarah Eady as Associate Justice in 2021 and John Savarese as Advocate and Gold Award recipient in 2017, both of whom I believe are here tonight. So please join me in congratulating Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz for their commitment and service. Jonathan Moses, a partner and co-chair of the firm's litigation department, uh, will accept the award on Wachtell's behalf. Um, well, thank you. It's good to see everybody, and thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. And I'm very pleased on behalf of my colleagues at Wachtell Lipton to uh, accept this award. I am actually a stand-in for Sarah Eddy, who cannot be here tonight. Many of you know her as a great appellate lawyer, among other things. But right now, she is torturing Elon Musk in the Twitter case. Uh, so I'm very glad that she's able to do that and free her up to do that. Uh, congratulations to all the honorees. These here actually have to work for their honor tonight. And uh, congratulations to Ezekiel for your courage and strength uh, and for inspiring us. Um, it is true that uh, the volunteer uh, appellate program is a rite of passage of sorts. Uh, my first appellate argument was for it. It was for a case uh, involving a uh, heroin drug bust in the Bronx and uh, I didn't win, but uh, it was a great experience and uh, it was a really wonderful opportunity as a young lawyer. Uh, we're very proud to partner with this wonderful organization. So I want to thank you all and thank you for this great honor. So this is just about my last test. So you can, you know, you won't get too tired of seeing me. So I want to tell you a little bit about tonight's case that will be argued. Students for Fair Admissions versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College. Affirmative action is an evolving and controversial method for expanding educational opportunities to historically excluded groups and creating diverse student bodies on campuses of higher learning. Affirmative action was long ago addressed by the United States Supreme Court in the 1978 case of Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. 
The court there held that quotas are un unlawful, but that consideration of race was permissible as long as it was one of several factors and met strict scrutiny standards. This was the rule for more than 25 years until two challenges against the University of Michigan in 2008. In Gratz versus Bollinger, the court held the university's undergraduate admissions affirmative action program was unlawful, but in Gruder versus Bollinger, the court held the law school's policy passed constitutional muster in that it furthered a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. In contrast to the other undergraduate program, the law school conducted an individualized review of each cap applicant and considered race as one of many factors. Ten years after those cases, there were two cases called Fisher I and Fisher II, where the United States Supreme Court again examined uh, an affirmative action program against the University of Texas. Uh, the first case, the, the Supreme Court sent back to the lower courts to determine whether all possible alternatives had been explored. And in the second case, uh, the court ruled in favor of the university. So that brings us to why we are here today. In 2014, the Students for Fair Admissions filed suit against Harvard, alleging that Harvard's admission program discriminates against Asian American applicants. SFFA, as they are called, dissected Harvard's six-prong application review program, in particular the personal index scores assigned to each student. And they allege that Asian American applicants uh, were disfavored and, and that the school relied on negative stereotypes. Harvard, however, countered that it used race in only limited ways and stated that there were no workable alternative that would achieve its narrowly tailored objective in creating a diverse student body of future global leaders. After several weeks of trial, competing experts and many other witnesses, the district court ruled in favor of Harvard. SFFA appealed to the First Circuit, circuit where again Harvard prevailed and this Supreme Court granted certiorari. This court will be asked to decide, one, if Grutter versus Bollinger should be overturned and make it unlawful for institutions of higher learning to use race as a factor in admissions, and two, whether more specifically, Harvard has discriminated against Asian Americans in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by engaging in race balancing, overemphasizing race, and rejecting work, workable race-neutral alternatives. So please join me now in the courtroom of the mock Supreme Court of the United States as I invite the court crier, Myrna Felder, to open this court session. The time is 10 a.m. The day is the first Monday in October 2022. Please rise. The justices of the mock Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, 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 all persons having business before the mock Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God bless the United States and this honorable court. Please be seated. The court will hear argument in number 201199, Students for Fair Admissions versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College. Mr. Benjamin, we will hear from you first. Please proceed. May it please the court, my name, my name, is, my name is Jim Benjamin, and I am the sacrificial lamb for tonight's program. <laughs> I have been given the task of arguing that Harvard's race-conscious admissions program is unlawful. <clears throat> so I will now get enrolled and do that. <clears throat> Madam Chief Justice, racism and racial discrimination have aptly been described as our country's original sin. And as we look back on history, it is a sobering reality that all too often our laws and our courts have been used as instruments of racial discrimination. And yet, despite that legacy, there is reason for hope. 
there is reason to believe that after so many broken promises and cynical reversals, our laws and our courts can finally move beyond our odious history of race-based classifications. And this appeal presents the court with an opportunity to take an important step down the path marked by Justice Harlan's famous dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, and in this court's landmark unanimous decision in Brown versus Board of Education, and to vindicate the animating principles of the 14th Amendment, namely that our Constitution is colorblind and that all citizens are entitled to the equal protection of the law, regardless of race or national origin. And it's for that reason that we ask this court to overrule Grutter versus Bollinger and to hold that the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act prohibit colleges and universities from considering an applicant's race in their admissions decision making. Mr. Benjamin, I'd like to ask you a question. I'd like to ask you about the public meaning of the 14th Amendment at the time that it was passed. I find it striking that at the time the 14th Amendment was passed, the same Congress passed laws that were, to my mind, explicitly race conscious with the goal of dismantling a social and economic hierarchy based on race. Would an originalist need to concede that race conscious policies are thus constitutionally permissible? Well, Your Honor, legislation after the Civil War is a terrible place to look if we are trying to give voice to the underlying purposes of the 14th Amendment as it was enacted by the Reconstruction Congress. The record of the passage of the post-Civil War amendments leaves no doubt that the framers of that amendment had high aspirations as embodied in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but it is one of the great scandals and shames of American history that after the triumph of those amendments and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, that all of that achievement was displaced by the horrors and the hypocrisies of Jim Crow and separate but equal. In this case, Your Honor, that contemporaneous legislation is something to be reviled, not emulated. I also will say it is ironic um, for Harvard to be pointing to history when Harvard's own history shows that the holistic admissions process that they um, rely on and cite so proudly was adopted in the 1920s for the specific and anti-Semitic purpose of limiting the number of Jews who would be offered admission. An amorphous criteria such as character and fitness were used to discriminate against Jewish applicants in a manner that resembles the current system in which these same amorphous and subjective criteria lead to results that statistically disfavor Asian American applicants by statistically significant margins. Is it your position then, counsel, that Harvard's current admissions practices were designed with the intent to discriminate against Asian Americans? Um, no, Your Honor, and the trial court found no evidence of overt racial animus, although the origins of this, this practice, as I've said, are, are anything um, but, um, but noble. Um, but actual animus is not determinative. Uh, Harvard is required to satisfy strict scrutiny regardless of the presence or absence of overt racial animus. And Harvard bears the burden of demonstrating that its practices survive strict scrutiny. And Your Honor, the most important part of the trial record here, and yes, we did have a trial, we had a three-week trial, is what was not disputed. Harvard admitted, admitted that it takes race into account at several different parts of the admission process it's clear in the decision below, Harvard acknowledges that admissions officers can and do take an applicant's race into account when assigning an overall rating. Harvard admits that race is considered. That is from page 22 of the decision below. Mr. Benjamin, I, I'd like to get a little bit more practical, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I infer from your argument that you would like uh, to take us back to a utopian time where college admissions were based on uh, 
nothing but merit. And if I'm right in that inference, um, it would be helpful if you would lay out for us what you would consider to be merit-based factors. Well, Your Honor, it is, it, it is certainly not um, our, our job as students for fair admission to dictate how Harvard how, or how any university should conduct their admissions process. Harvard has a very elaborate process where they take into account all the different metrics of an applicant's academic achievement, extracurricular engagement, athletic um, abilities, school support, and all of that makes, makes perfect sense. Um, what they can't do uh, is take the, an applicant's skin color, national origin, into account. That, that's forbidden. Um, diversity of experience, diversity of background, all completely fine. What they can't do is use race as a crutch, as a proxy for stereotypical judgments about people's character or um, point of view. But, but Mr. Benjamin, aren't you simply dismissing the interests that Harvard has articulated here, that both the trial court and the First Circuit found compelling and sufficient uh, to justify their desire for diversity for all the reasons that they have carefully studied and set forth repeatedly that the Office of Civil Rights didn't quibble with. You know, you are conceding that it is not your place to fashion their admissions decision, but you're dismissing uh, what all of the courts below have found a very compelling interest. Well, with respect, you know, and Harvard commissioned a report um, uh, chaired by their, their, the dean of the college, the so-called Corona Report. Um, but with respect, you know, Harvard's own views that its practices are, are, are fine um, really are not entitled to, to deference. Um, the question isn't whether Harvard thinks it's doing a good job. The question is whether Harvard's practices are consistent with the mandate of the 14th Amendment that benefits should not be accorded or um, withheld based on a person's race. Uh, and that is precisely what Harvard does. Um, they admit it, they're open about it. We know that it matters from the statistics that were adduced at trial. And frankly, the time has come to once and for all overrule uh, these dated precedents and give voice to the promise of the 14th Amendment. Mr. Benjamin, I'm trying to understand, and I hope you can help me, your position with respect to how Harvard's admissions policies stereotype um, people, because isn't it the case that it's the opposite of stereotyping to admit, for example, a critical mass of underrepresented minorities so that all, you know, so that on the understanding that there is not one person of a particular minority who represents everyone. So you have to have a critical mass so that all perspectives are, are represented in the classrooms. Well, Your Honor, again, with respect, the, the, the premise that a college um, should strive for diversity in its student body is completely um, unobjectionable. Um, that's a laudable goal. Um, we live in a pluralistic society, and of course it makes sense for universities to embody uh, all of that in their university communities. The, the problem is that Harvard uses race as a proxy for diversity of thought and diversity of perspective. And that is pure stereotyping. But if, is, it, is it stereotyping? To, uh, to believe that someone who lives on this earth as a black person or as a Latinx person or as an, even an Asian American person doesn't have a different experience than someone who is white. Your Honor, if, if Harvard chose, and they say they conduct an individualized um, admissions process, if they chose to um, take into account in their admissions process someone's individualized experience growing up as a person of color or 
um, existing in this world, you know, with their cultural background is an important part of who they are. Again, no problem. Where we have a problem with Harvard is they assign a tip, a plus, based on race that has nothing to do with the applicant's individual experiences. It's but based you, on what box the person checks. Counselor, do Asian applicants get that tip? Asian applicants most certainly do not get that tip. They don't, and the and the results of the statistics, um, unfortunately, you know, show it um, quite quite clearly. Um, the, the the tip is not made available to to Asian applicants. One of the things that you've argued is that universities like Harvard should give up uh, legacy admissions and donor admissions or preferences. <clears throat> you don't argue that that would be required by Harvard or other universities, is that right? Certainly not, Justice Goldstein. Again, it's, it's, it's not our job to dictate to Harvard but, how but, they but if operate. But if, if, if preferences like that are permissible and by their nature end up perpetuating prior discrimination, I mean, that's why legacy admissions tilt toward you know, wealthy white people. Isn't there an argument that in order to counter that, Harvard should be well within its rights to give some preference, some tip in the other direction in order to balance it out? The 14th Amendment says no. The 14th Amendment says you can't start down the road of using race as a proxy once you start down that but why path. is that a proxy? I mean, it's just a straight up balancing. And, and the 14th Amendment and, our, and this court's precedent say you cannot achieve, strike to achieve racial balancing. That is, an, that is an impermissible classification based on race. Again. If Harvard wants to give benefits to children of wealthy donors or legacies, they're certainly within their rights to do that. I, I can't imagine they would ever say that they're doing that because that group happens to be predominantly white or any of some other uh, demographic background. Um, it is the race-based classification that is forbidden under this court's precedence, and, and we would respectfully submit, um, you know, Grutter, which had its own self-destruct mechanism, you know, with a, uh, an admonition that it wouldn't be needed after 25 years. When this court decides this case next year, we will be entering the 24th year since Grutter. The can, time can has come. Us, can you tell us what has changed over the last 25 years that justifies a huge change in the law like this? Well, Grutter itself, th th that's, I think, where, um, Your Honor, with respect, this is not a change in the law. In her opinion, in Grutter, I would add for a very narrow 5-4 majority, Justice O'Connor stated that the court's approval of the University of Michigan Law School's race-based admissions policy was finite and transitional. And she emphasized that, a, I'm quoting, a core purpose of the 14th Amendment is to uh, do away with all governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. And for that reason, she and the court put a 25-year clock, which that clock is now about to expire. And counsel, isn't and, it and fair counsel to... I'm sorry, your clock is also Thank you. Uh, That's a perfect, perfect, uh, perfect note. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Benjamin. We will now hear from Mr. Rico. I would like to um, share with the court uh, a different kind of insight into, into this issue and, and to try to stay away from what I call sort of like the cornballish um, cliches that really um, sabotage this very important issue. So I would like to start with a personal connection. So I'm going to dedicate my comments to the court this morning in the memory of Edward D. Wilford and Bruce McIntyre. And when I mention both of those lawyers' names, many people in this room take a moment and pause. Because they know when they met Edward D. Wilford and Bruce McIntyre, who were both deceased, who both did not live past their 50s, they met two of the finest lawyers, finest gentlemen, 
finest advocates that they can meet. Both of those men benefited from programs such as Harvard University. And but for those programs, those precious memories that you have from both of those individuals would not exist because they would have not been accepted into law school because somebody would have made a determination that based upon their objective scores, they didn't have the capability of functioning in the profession. So I'm, I'm going to start with Ed and Bruce, and I'm going to end there. And so terms I like to use is called honor and worthiness. The courts call it a compelling interest. I call it an interest of honor. If this court views diversity as an interest worthy of honor, then it helps shape how you think about how do we maintain it or resolve it. So let's start with um, Harvard University's admissions policy, which is a flexible policy. And, and check this out. Look who some of those, in, look at some of the individuals who that very same policy that, you know, Mr. Benjamin, uh, you know, really saying is a bad thing. Uh, let's, let's look at some of the individuals that that policy has produced. A couple of people on the panel here, by the way. But that's a different story. We won't go there. But let's look at this. The compelling interest is not to produce lively classroom discussion. The compelling interest is to produce leaders who can go out into the 21st century and lead our country out of the malaise and chaotic way in which we live today. Harvard University's flexible policy has produced United States District Court judges such as Deborah Batts, Vernon Broderick, Andrew Carter, United States Attorney Damian Williams, members of the United States Courts of Appeals, such as Ray Loye, members of the United States Supreme Court, such as Kentaji Brown Jackson, <laughs> members of the United States Senate, such as Ted Cruz, <laughs> And even higher, an individual who served as the 44th president of the United States of our nation. Each one of those individuals have come through a program that a couple of disappointed students with some friends on the court are saying that program should end. Now, I don't know about the rest of you. Mr. Rico. Um Go ahead. Is there any reason to think that the, the sort of tipping factor impacted the admissions of the distinguished individuals you just listed? Which fact? I didn't hear. That the race was the deciding factor in their admission. There's no basis to conclude that, isn't that right? Not a chance in the world that race was the controlling factor in deciding whether or not Barack Obama was going to go to Harvard University or Deborah Batts or Vernon Broderick, or Andrew Carter. I can't speak about Ted Cruz, but <laughs> no, I, I, no, not at all. And I want to I wanna get to that, because Mr. that goes to this whole honor and trust thing. Mr. Rico? Yes. Um, Harvard takes into account race, even where the applicant has not identified that as an important factor to their personal story in their application. So how is that holistic and individualized? as is required? You know, because you have individuals like myself. You're not going to, I don't check a box that says I'm African American, so therefore you should blank. Race has been an indelible part of my legacy and my life, living in our nation. And so Harvard's program is so robust that it says, well, it's like, you know, those 3553A factors. You're going to look at a person's background and experiences to determine the sentence as sufficient but not greater than necessary to impose appropriate punishment. 
Well, the individuals who come before the court all walk in a different path. And as one district court judge said to me, well, why don't we just send this a run-of-the-mill robbery case? Said, well, judge, the case may be run-of-the-mill, but the defendants are hardly run-of-the-mill. And so Harvard's program is so dynamic that even when a person doesn't check the box that says, I'm black, let me go to Harvard Law School because I'm black, Harvard's admission process says, let's look at who this student is. Because the notion that there's this monolithic blackness, is, first of all, it's a misnomer. Mr. Um, Rico, yes, our judge. precedents suggest that uh, universities can consider diversity as a value that allows them to consider race and admissions. Are you suggesting that we should broaden the way we consider, the way we allow universities to consider race? And are you perhaps arguing that we should overturn our precedents for a different reason? No, I, I, I'm not arguing that you should overturn the president, precedents for any reason. But I do think how we evaluate students is a work in progress. And that um, if you can't trust the people at Harvard who are producing the likes of presidents of the United States and court of appeals judges, then there's a deeper problem. But Mr. Rico, Harvard, isn't that the same university that did discriminate against Jewish applicants? They did in the 1920s, and they stopped because pressure was put on them to do that. And it was also a university that also excluded African Americans from attending those universities. Now, of course, the great W.E.B. Du Bois graduated from Harvard University. County Cullen, the great African American poet, graduated from Harvard University. And so what's your Mo response Trotta? to uh, your opposing counsel's argument that it's been 25 years almost, time is running up. As you mentioned, there mm -hmm. have been great strides. There's right. been a president of the United States who's gone through that university. Why does it mean to continue into year 26 or 30 or 35? You know, I, it's almost like you wrote my remarks. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing I want to tell you is this. There are some people in this room who were around when there was euphoria over Brown versus Board of Ed. And there was a great uh, uh, jamboree held here in New York. And Constant Baker Motley addressed a, a room of thousands of people. And Constant Baker Motley said, with the Brown decision today and 25 years from now, we will see the dissipation of unequal education in our country. So 25 years from 1959 takes you around 1979, Baker, I mean, um, Baki. Um, so to go directly to your point, some people would say, well, Barack Obama and all of that means, well, that isn't the time that we end this. Well, the, the court said in Gruda it should end, it should sunset, or it should have points of verification to see whether or not these goals still require this type of approach, and Harvard has done that. But I would say this to you, as long as New York County is the most segregated school district in our country, 68 years after Brown versus Board of Ed, and as long as a president of the United States can get away with filling 54 vacancies in the United States Courts of Appeals and not even consider one African-American candidate. And when we live in a world where black children in 2022 continue to suffer from public humiliation and have their spirits destroyed by being purposely bypassed for a hug by a Muppet while they're on vacation at Sesame Place, the time for sunsetting these is far from over. Mr. 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 Rico, how, yeah. how do you uh, address um, Mr. Benjamin's argument? I mean, and you've acknowledged that being black, blackness is not a monolith. There, right. are, there, there are different experience, lived experiences. How do you address the argument that it's stereotyping to assume that black, a black person, a Hispanic person, um, is going to have a different 
with a different perspective to offer in the classroom. Why is that a reasonable assumption on Harvard's part? And is that not just racial stereotyping? Well, if you put it that way, of course it's racial stereotyping. I mean, it's like thinking that all black people can dunk or dance. Um, all black people can't dunk and all black people can't dance. Um, I think that the, the issue of diversity is far more dynamic than that. Harvard University should be, should be a model for other schools to start producing some district court judges and court of appeals judges and United States Senate members. But it was other schools that produced Ed Wolford. Ed but, Wolford didn't get Ms. to Ms. Harvard Ms. when they got into Harvard. Ms. Frico, can you yeah. what is the actual difference, the legal difference between the Harvard tip system and the bonus point system that was struck down in Bakke. Why is there any difference? Well, because because the in Bakke, first of all, they had the quotas. They were setting aside uh, a certain number of seats, period, and they were going to fill those seats regardless of the qualifications of the people. So that that's problematic. The tips idea from Harvard really. Race is really one of many tips that they use. They, those tips deal with unusual intelligence, unusual create, creativity. Uh, so and so can run a world record mile relay. Um, these are, we, they, they're called tips, but aren't they really like personal factors about the individual? And again, it's not the person's skin color, it is what have they lived and what are their perspectives about their life? That's a dynamic process. So I'm going to give you an example. Many of you practice in the Southern District of New York. And present out here somewhere is Peter Quijano. And he and some other lawyers who practice in the Southern District of New York created a diversity mentoring program for the purposes of increasing uh, um, racial diversity on the CJA panel. That program has been in existence for 10 years now, and 38 people have gone through the program and are now on the panel. Several of them are here. So the point is this. The judges of the district adopted a panel to increase diversity because they thought it was a worthwhile and honorable goal. The second part of it is that they trusted the judgment of the gatekeepers to ensure that the process would be fair. And sure enough, it is fair. Because in the Southern District's diversity program, anybody can participate, and everyone does. And so we have, it just turned out that way. Without keeping math, a third of the people have been white men, the third of them have been women, and the other third have been black, Latino, and Asian uh, people. Now, a couple of those lawyers who have gone through that panel, they're like Ed Wolfen and Bruce all over again. They've gone through this program that was set up, and none of these people would have ever gotten on the Southern District panel without this type of program. So the point is this. Um, Kim Montgomery, who's sitting behind me, went through that program. Kim Montgomery is now, in our country, uh, considered a learned counsel in capital cases. He's been poached from the Southern District, and he's representing a cop-killing case in Philadelphia as learned counsel. John Diaz. Uh, another person who came through that Southern District Mentoring Program. Are you, but, sir, are you saying that it's impossible to create some other system that would also have elevated all of these wonderful names that you've been mentioning? I don't know about impossible. I do know this, that none of these people would have been on the panel unless somebody of integrity looked at the issue of diversity and said, let's see if we can devise a program. So Kim Montgomery, who's sitting behind me, he didn't, he's not hardly appointed to represent a defendant facing uh, the murder of a police officer because he's black. Okay. John Diaz is not hardly representing Jesus Feliciano Trinidad in Philadelphia, in, which was then a death-authorized case, but Mr. Reed, he's a Latino. I want to go back to what my colleague asked. Go right he asked ahead. you about the TIP program. Yes. And you, as I understand it, explained that the reason it's important to have that program is because people bring their life experiences to the table and that accounts for that. So 
Given that, I want to ask you a couple of hypotheticals. Sure. So, if my colleague Clarence Thomas applies to Harvard, does he deserve a tip? I, I, he should get whatever tips anybody else gets who comes from a little town out in the middle of nowhere, you know, um, who um, is applying to school. I, I sure he should. And, and so, what would he be adding to diversity and Harvard's goals? He would. He would be adding. He would be adding the pers the perspective of exactly what we don't need to do in our country if we're ever going to change the direction. Um, so, um, I, look, I'm not mad at Clarence Thomas because he had an opportunity. I question what he has done having had that opportunity. I mean, Ed Wolford, Bruce McIntyre, they had opportunities. They honored those um, those opportunities with outstanding service to the courts and, of course, to their families, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I just wanted to mention that the program has also produced Granye O'Neill and Anthony Sacuti and uh, Stephen Lynch, who's present here, Natalie Todd, who's on one of our few deaf authorized cases here uh, in the Eastern District. These are outstanding lawyers. And, um, Steve who's here, Anthony Scudi, Granny, they're hardly African-American, they're hardly Latinx, but their life, their life path brought diversity of concept to our Southern District panel. And the judges uh, had confidence that Peter Quijano and others uh, would use outstanding judgment. So Peter would laugh himself sick if somebody said, well, you're picking somebody because they black. But I mean, we, Mr. Rico, in that program, was there yes. did did the did the pan the CJA panel or the those selecting the panel did they give a tip to to those folks? I mean, it seems to me what you're describing is what Mr. Benjamin and his col his clients have advocated, which is race blind efforts to. Um, improve diversity without discriminating against other people. You know, I, I you know I don't like words like tips. You know, because they sound like sneaky, right? <laughs> Tip. Your Yo. client came up with it. <laughs> Listen, they they wouldn't have me at this. I would have told, told them to come up with another name other than tip. But what they use as tips is are called plus factors. And I think that somewhere at St. John's, when Ed Wolford applied to St. John's University, and Ed went in for his interview, somebody sat in that interview and said, you know, this guy's grades are not that great, but there's something about him. Now, there's two people out here who grew up on 8th Avenue. One spent 30 years in the penitentiary. Another one is an executive in the music business today. Those individuals' lives went in different paths, when Ed went to St. John, somebody who interviewed Ed Wolford said, this guy has an unusual keen sense of intelligence. Harvard calls it a tip. Um, he has an unusual charismatic personality. And they decided that these factors fit snugly into the overall mission of increasing the diversity of the student population as the school gears itself towards preparing people um, for the future. Thank you, um, Mr. Rico. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, but I, I, we're trying I, to keep things on track here. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> no. You're good? So I, I also just wanted to say this, and I'll sit down, Jim, if you don't mind. <laughs> You're cutting into Mr. Benjamin's rebuttal time. He's all right. Jim's a good guy. <laughs> he, he does, he's the same way in court. He's, he, he would say, judge, let him go ahead. <laughs> yes, where the judge has absolutely no control. That's right. <laughs> so I would say this. It's a little different, but it's, it's, an, it's an analogy of sorts. You know, we had, a, we had a practice in this country where people had to sit in the back of the bus. And they had to sit back there even though there were other seats. And they were tired and they were, you know, worthy of being able to sit. And other people sat in the front of the bus comfortable you know, exercising their birthright, you know, their privilege in society. Well, a time came when that had to change. And when that change came, it was uncomfortable. The people in the front looked at it as a great intrusion. 
They felt that giving up their seats, that policy's taking them away from something. For the people who were stuck in the back of the bus, they felt as though this was a game changer for them. They could finally rest at the end of a long day. So I would say to this court, if diversity is a dirty word, like a tip, then you think about it accordingly. But increasing, if we can get some more Barack Obamas and Ed Wolfords, Chani Jackson Browns, we need to be all about developing those programs. And for the people who produce them, we, contrary to what uh, Jim said in his argument, we need to be listening to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rico. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's keep I, it quick, Mr. I, I knew this was going to be rough, but I actually, actually had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. Oh my God! All right, first of all, um, I haven't thought about Ed Wolford in a long time, but that, that's thank you for ra bringing Ed back into this room and reminding us of, of Ed. Um, he was a very special, special guy. Um, so I have, I have, I think, just one really. Totally futile, <laughs> useless attempt to, to rebut that brilliant, uh, unrebuttable presentation. Um, you know, I guess what, I, what I'll say, uh, discharging my, my duty to uh, advocate on behalf of my client here, um, th this is the, you know, I think what, what Tony said is something really nobody can argue against. Um, diversity is important. Opportunity is important. Um, and the people that Tony has uh, cited in their inspiring stories is, is really what makes our country um, the place that we all are, 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 are proud of, and it's, 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 it's the road that we aspire to be on. But th the issue is, and it, and it is an issue, um, you know, is, is how, how, do, how does Harvard use race? If it's part of an individual story and narrative, again, I don't think there's any basis to question that. Um, but calling it a tip and calling it a plus factor, um, you know, for some people, it's not going to make any difference at all. And I think to, um, I think it was Justice Boone or Justice Goldstein's question, you know, Barack Obama undoubtedly would have gotten into Harvard regardless. Um, but there are other students at the margins in either direction where this tip, and it is a tip, and it is what, sorry, that is what your client, that's the evidence that uh, you gotta deal with there, sorry about that. But, but the tip does make a difference. Um, and, and one of the striking findings in the trial court is that over a multi-year period, that the court found that race was the determinative factor for 45% of the African American and Hispanic students who were admitted to Harvard. Um, and that, that's, those are, that, that is how this operates in practice. Um, you know, it's, it's, not as, it, it's not the same as a quota in Baki. Um, it's not that crude, but the effect for people on the margins um, is the same. With that, thank you, Your Honor. And I will now sit down. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, the case is now submitted. Is the mock Supreme Court of the United States now stands adjourned. The court will reconvene on Monday, October 2, 2023 at 10 a.m. Thank you, Jim and Tony. That was everything we expected, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Borton. I'm the chair of OAD, and I'm, I'm proud to have been the chair for, I think, the last five years. Um, I want to thank everybody for the inspiring show of support tonight. Caprice told you um, how successful this fundraiser has been, and it's great to see so many friends uh, here tonight. Um, so thank you for turning out and for coming to watch these two legendary advocates go head to head. I'm confident you enjoyed it as much as I did.
Thank you, Jim and Tony, and to all of tonight's justices for dedicating your time and your talent to this exceptionally worthy cause. Uh, the sacrifice that you make, and we know it is a sacrifice to prepare uh, and perform at this event, is what makes this, we think, the, the best fundraiser that exists. Um, it is also true that the Gould Award, which uh, I'm about to present, um, is the only one, at least that I'm aware of, that comes with the burden of having to prove that you deserve it. <laughs> um, in front of all of your peers and the people that you know, it is, uh, it is quite an undertaking. Um, as I said, our expectations were very high and, and you both managed to exceed them. <laughs> so thank you for that. So the good news is the hard part is over. Um, now comes the easy part. We get to give you an award and praise you in front of all of your peers. And I have the great pleasure to start with my friend, Jim Benjamin. Uh, Jim is quite simply one of the country's top white collar criminal defense attorneys. Uh, his career began auspiciously. He graduated second in his class from the University of Virginia School of Law and served as an editor of the Law Review. He then clerked for Judge Frederick Mott in the District of Maryland and for Justices Powell and Stevens on the Supreme Court. He then went on to serve as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, where he was there for more than five years and served as the deputy chief appellate attorney and as a member of the Securities and Commodities Fraud Task Force. And for many years, he has led Aiken Gump's uh, uh, incredibly esteemed white collar defense practice. And from, so for more than 20 years, he has represented corporate and individual clients in an incredible variety of complex and high pressure government investigations. He's, he's tried numerous cases and it'll come as no surprise. He's argued many cases before federal and state courts of appeal. Um, but what I wanted to talk about just for a minute tonight is how effective an advocate he is outside of the courtroom and behind the scenes. Because one of the unusual aspects of being a white collar criminal defense attorney is that your greatest accomplishments are often totally unnoticed. Because the ultimate success is that an investigation never gets brought and that your client is never charged and therefore never known. And I had the, the great fortune of watching Jim achieve that ultimate success in a case we had together several years ago. He represented the executive of a bank who looked certain to be charged with securities fraud, which both of us thought would have been a terrible injustice, but the prosecutor seemed pretty convinced of his guilt. And over the course of many months, Jim skillfully and patiently persuaded the government not to bring charges. It was, of course, a life-changing result for his client, who was able to keep his job and his career. And the fact that none of you know his name or will know his name was the sweetest victory of all. And, and Jim did that not, not by pounding the table, not by making threats, um, but by calmly and reasonably, I think you got a sense of that tonight, persuading the prosecutors over the course of numerous meetings and phone calls that the evidence to bring the case just wasn't there. It certainly didn't hurt that cause and, and Jim's you know, other uh, endeavors that he is without a doubt among the very nicest people in our profession. He is unfailingly kind, calm, and considerate of others. He treats everyone with total respect. And so you listen carefully to every point that he makes because you know that his argument will be thoughtful and reasonable. You saw a flash, I think, of his fortitude too in his willingness to take on the petitioner's side in this argument in front of a New York City audience. Um, and all of those qualities are the reasons that why when, when I need to recommend counsel to the senior executive of, uh, of a client, 
Jim is always at the very top of my list because I know the client will not only receive extraordinary legal advice and representation, but that he's really going to like and respect his lawyer too. And for selfish reasons, reasons it means that I'll also get to work with Jim, which is always a pleasure and, and one of my favorite things uh, in this practice. Now, in addition to being a tireless advocate for his clients, Jim also takes an active role in the advancement of our profession. He's a former chair of the New York City Bar Association's Task Force on National Security and the Rule of Law. And for the last 14 years, he has served as the co-chair of PLI's annual CLE program on white collar enforcement. It's an incredible undertaking he does every year to organize that. Um, his public service goes way back to his time at Dartmouth, where he was awarded uh, the Colby Prize for the student who demonstrates an exemplary commitment to public service. And he has maintained that commitment over the years uh, in an, on a number of nonprofit and professional boards. He serves as a director of the City Bar Fund and has served as a director of the New York City Council of Defense Lawyers. And he's a member of the Board of Advocates of Human Rights First. You really cannot find a better lawyer or a better person anywhere in this country. For all of those reasons, I am incredibly honored to present OAD's 2022 Gould Award for Outstanding Advocacy to Jim Benjamin. Well, Nick, thank you. That was completely over the top. Um, I think you feel bad about making me argue that side of the case. <laughs> um, so I, I really, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I want to just say a few thank yous, and then I actually had a few remarks I, I, I wanted to give. Um, I want to thank OAD for this award, um, which uh, I have to say I feel truly unworthy uh, to receive. Um, OAD's work is an inspiration to all of us who care about equal access to justice and the rule of law. Um, and so Caprice and your whole team, I just want to thank you for all that you do on behalf of your clients and on behalf of, of our community. Um, I also want to thank Tony <laughs> for sharing the stage with me. And Tony, I want to thank you for all that you have done to advance the cause of justice in your incredible career. And um, your just sustained practice of law at the very, very highest level. Um, you are a legend, um, and um, I admire you uh, tremendously. Um, I want to thank uh, my friends who are here tonight, including so many members of, of the White Collar Bar, my amazing colleagues from Aiken Gump, um, some old and dear friends from college, and spoiler alert, as you heard from Nick, we did not go to Harvard. So it actually, I felt kind of good up there trashing Harvard. That was... It's always kind of fun. Um, and then I want to thank my family, especially my amazing wife, Jessica, my son, Charlie, my father-in-law, Miles, all of whom are here tonight, um, as well as other, uh, my other kids who, who are, uh, have better things to do and long ago decided they're not really that interested in dad's legal stuff. So um, I, I wanted to just talk, in the early 1990s, um, as you heard from Nick, I had the incredible good fortune to serve as a law clerk um, at the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. For me, Justice Powell was a mentor and a role model, and with your permission, I'd like to say a few words about his life. At the time of Pearl Harbor, Justice Powell was in his mid-30s with a young family. He was living in Richmond, and he had recently made partner at Hunt and Williams. But Justice Powell left his family and he volunteered for the army. He stormed the beaches of North Africa and later he had an extraordinary career in military intelligence. By the end of the war, he had risen to the rank of colonel and he delivered daily intelligence briefings to General Eisenhower. In 1944 and 1945, Justice Powell was the US Army liaison to Project Ultra in England a top
top secret program that developed the Enigma machine to crack Nazi codes. If you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, you know what I'm talking about. After the war, in the 1950s, Justice Powell served as the president of the Richmond School Board when Brown versus Board of Education was decided. After Brown, Justice Powell presided over an orderly process of integration, unlike almost every other jurisdiction in the Commonwealth of Virginia. In those years, Justice Powell, a child of the segregated South, became friends with Oliver Hill, the head of the NAACP in Richmond. That friendship lasted a lifetime. Mr. Hill later made public statements in support of Justice Powell's confirmation to the Supreme Court, describing him as, quote, a man whose heart is right. In 1990, the year that I graduated from law school at the University of Virginia, Justice Powell administered the oath of office to Doug Wilder, Virginia's first black governor. After Justice Powell retired from active service on the Supreme Court, he stated publicly that the opinion of which he was most proud was Bakke. Justice Powell's biographer tells the story of how the justice arrived at the brilliant and practical, and I think that was the Chief Justice's term, so Justice Powell would agree, idea that diversity should be recognized as a compelling government interest. On the court in 1978, Justice Powell was alone in that view. But he was right. At the time, his opinion was described as Solomonic and an act of, quote, judicial statesmanship. The principles that Justice Powell articulated have been the foundation of so much of our collective experience for the last 45 years. And I think um, it, it's, it's clear that Bakke is now in grave jeopardy. For me, after spending a year working in Justice Powell's chambers at the Supreme Court, my overriding impression of him was his personal qualities. He was modest, kind, hardworking, self-effacing, and respectful. In my opinion, we would be much better off as a country if we had more people like Justice Lewis F. Powell Jr. in public life today. Thank you. Good evening, I'm, I'm Sean Hecker and I'm, I'm one of the uh, board members at OAD and I want to con congratulate uh, everyone for participating tonight so effectively. Uh, and Jim, that was uh, a wonderful argument and wonderful remarks. But I have the distinct honor of being able to present the Gould Award uh, to Tony Rico, a man I've admired from the time I was, I was a law clerk 25 years ago. It was true then and it's true now that when Tony Rico walks into your courtroom, you sit up, you pay attention, you take notice. Because Tony Rico is simply one of the greatest, most effective criminal defense lawyers of his time. And Tony Rico didn't make a name for himself by taking the easy cases. I did a little research on Tony. The list of cases is truly remarkable. The World Trade bombing case, the embassy bombing case. Tony Rico has been counsel in 60 federal death penalty cases. And before New York State outlawed the death penalty, Tony Rico had another 12 death penalty cases in New York State. Think about that for a minute. Some of us have worked on a death penalty case, maybe even two. The toll it takes to work on single case is difficult to fathom. I still remember the first time I worked on a case and it sticks to me with me to this day. Now imagine representing more than 70 clients who are at risk of being put to death. And that man has done that alone. Truly astonishing. And Tony doesn't just represent each and every client with tremendous skill and great compassion, though he's done that for 40 years now, which is kind of hard to believe. On top of that, he works to make our entire criminal justice system a little bit more just. He served for many years on the faculty of the Brian, I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, Sketchmeister uh, 
Death Penalty College in California during his summers. He's part of the leadership group of the National Capital Resource Defense Project. He's the CJA representative in Brooklyn, New York, and as you got a flavor tonight, has mentored countless young lawyers to get them on the panel uh, in Brooklyn and the Southern District of New York. He served as president of the New York Criminal Bar Association. He's a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's received numerous awards from state bar associations, and I suspect he'd be equally proud of having been honored a couple years ago at the Harlem Honors Award Ceremony in 2019, uh, where he was born and raised. In short, from my perspective, on a tonight like this, where we honor OAD and its commitment to its clients, it is so fitting that uh, we honor Tony Rico tonight as one of our Gould Award nom uh, awardees, honorees. Tony, come on up. Um, my man said it best. Thank you. <laughs> he sat down. <laughs> Boy, that's a great place to be. I'm proud of you, man. I don't know you, but I know what you've been through. And the road ahead of you is going to be even better. Sitting behind you with a bow tie on is a guy who served prosecuted by the Southern District. He served almost 30 years in the penitentiary. And now he's doing tremendous things. Pete Rolock is doing tremendous things, uh, helping young people who are incarcerated through a program developed in the Southern District. So I want to say thank you to OAD. Thank, you know, it's kind of hard to I mean, it's hard to say thank you to everyone. Um, but tonight, I, I, I'm accepting this award on behalf of a colleague that some of you may have heard of. His name was Billy Southern. And Billy Southern was a resource counsel who worked on those challenging death penalty cases. And last Thursday night, Billy went home and committed suicide. The challenges of capital work hurt his soul and destroyed him. And I've often wondered if I could have been a better friend to Billy. And I wonder whether or not he was able to hear the angels whispering. When I came out of law school, Jim, I, I worked for a judge who was in the Second World War also. His name was Bruce Wright. And the newspapers dubbed him, Turn Him Loose Bruce. And he had a different impact and relationship in the Second World War but he had the same kind of impact on me as a, a young lawyer. Um, Judge Wright was one of the angels who whispered into the ear of a young kid from 8th Avenue who used to throw rocks at the tour buses. And what Judge Wright said to me was practicing law would be like being on a great adventure where each day would bring a new challenge. And it has been just that. It has been a remarkable journey, and many of the people here are folks that I've met along the way, that I've had cases with, from Nick to Victor Hose here, Jeremy Timken, Dan, I mean, it's just, and, and Joan, we, we've had so many different cases together, and uh, it has been remarkable. Everyone has to find a sense of fulfillment, and for me, it just recently has come to me. And I'm on trial right now in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. And there's a young lawyer on trial with me. His name is John Diaz. He's on the Eastern District and Southern District panels here. I mentioned earlier he went through the mentoring program. And John is on trial there and um, with me. And we're trying this case together. It is rewarding for me to, to recognize that in some small way, that I had something to do with this remarkable kid from the Bronx 
who never would have had the opportunity, but for somebody went with a tip and decided to give him an opportunity. I've, all, I've had the opportunity to work with Kim Montgomery, who's sitting behind the podium there. Ken is outstanding. He's learning counsel on a cop killing case in Philly, and he's also on a learning counsel on another case out in Colorado, who's come through our district. And then there's Natalie Todd on the seance case here, and there's so many others. There's a great sense of professional fulfillment to think that in some small way that I've helped um, these fabulous lawyers um, gain entry and be a part of, of a tremendous profession, a profession where we can make arguments and change a person's life, you know, if you committed enough. Or you could just keep walking by and leave them sitting there. The choice is yours. Um, so I wanted just to say that um, to all the litigants and people who are in the minds, that's M-I-N-D-S, who take up this challenge every day as a part of their life, um, I accept this award from OAD on behalf of all of them, and in particular Billy Southern, and especially Billy Southern, whose soul was damaged and hurt while doing this. A lot of you've, ra you've raised money for a, a tremendous program, a program that makes a difference. People like Billy Southern need the support because the, the responsibility, the task is difficult. So I've always been a great angel, whisperer, listener. And my most important angel whisperer is sitting here tonight. Um, I have very rarely have ever done this. But uh, so, and that person is my remarkable soulmate, uh, my wife of 37 years. Um, whatever I've accomplished professionally just would not have happened but for you. And my children are here, my son and Yende, my daughter's over there, Nayila. Wonderful young people. And I have to tell you this. So I went to school on one of those no good affirmative action programs, right? <laughs> Somebody interviewed me and they said, uh, you know, his score's a little low, but you know what? Oh, maybe we should give him a shot. I mean, you know, he might be able to do something. Well, th that's what we're looking for in our country, right? We're looking for the tips, the insights, the subtleties about the human experience that allows people to flourish and fulfill their God-given talents and abilities. You know, Somebody took a chance on, on me, which is why I'm involved in taking chances on other people, and I feel like I'm strong enough to do it. There's room for all of us. We don't have to fight over, oh, you know, I didn't, listen, if you didn't get into Harvard, go somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> your life is not going to be over. I mean, there's people, there's people here that's doing just fine, thank you, who didn't go to Harvard Law School. I mean, it's like, yo, everybody can't go there. If everybody goes there, then it ain't going to be worth going to. And so what we do is we recognize that change is an inevitable part of who we are. You know, there's people who say, oh, people shouldn't get loan forgiveness because I had to pay mine back. So what? I mean, come on. We have to think bigger and broader than that. We have so many tremendous challenges before us. So I could go on. I'm not. Because I got to get back to Philly. And there's a man here, Lenny Ward, who made it possible for me to be here. Now, he drove me up from Philly. And when this is over, he's going to take me back to Philly, so Judge Sanchez will be happy in the morning. But on a serious side, I wanted to say thank you very much. And Jim, I was looking forward to doing this argument with you. I knew you was going to be exactly the way you were. You know, um, Jim, Jim Benjamin, um, he was in the U.S. Attorney's Office. It was different than today, and you former assistants who have to deal with these new assistants know exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> okay? 
It was different, a, an ability to listen and to think about what was being said as opposed to reacting, an important quality of, of any successful lawyer. So, and then there are many assistants here, Jeremy, Victor, Sean, Dan, you know, and then Norman Rima is here. And I spoke to Norman, Norman's sitting in the back. Norman is another person, early on, I met Norman, gee, at the big, myself, Ed, and others, um, Norman was a superstar at the bar who embraced us as young lawyers and was just a tremendous role model. So it means so much to me that, that Norman is here tonight. Um, and um, yeah, I saw Norman early and I said, Norman, I still got my hands up high and I'm still looking out for the Joe Frazier left over. So I'm going to end by saying thank you. Please thank you, the board, thank you, and everyone thank you. And hopefully, you know, we've all learned something from, from each other that will make this world a place that we live better. And let's contribute and look out for the lawyers like Billy Southern, who really lost his life doing what many of us do every day. Thank you very much. Pretty serious flex to be on trial and then to come to New York to pick up your award. I mean, that's, a, that's something. Um, I now have the pleasure of presenting this year's Council of Justice Award to Kathy Rumler. And I have to say, while I admired Kathy from afar and gotten to know her a bit when she was in private practice, including when she served in Associate Justice, so there's hope for all of you to be elevated uh, someday. Um, uh, but it was only in doing homework for tonight that I realized just how truly extraordinary her career has been. And extraordinary is no hyperbole. Kathy, of, of course, serves as chief legal officer and general counsel, counsel of Goldman Sachs, where she serves on the firm's management committee. And before she joined Goldman uh, a few years ago, she was global chair of the white collar and investigations practice at Latham where she had a few different stints in private practice in between government service. And those positions are impressive, um, uh, but I'm really just getting started. And if she'd never had either of those jobs, her career would have been extraordinary. It's kind of shocking that she's fit all this in in such a short time. So backing up just a little bit, as I understand it, Kathy came from a small rural town in Washington attended the University of Washington, and if I believe what I read in an interview, she went to Georgetown Law School before ever having met a practicing lawyer, uh, seemed to take to the law, uh, became the editor-in-chief of the Georgetown Law Review before clerking on the Third Circuit for Judge Timothy Lewis. She did a short stint in private practice at Latham before leaving after a few years to serve as associate counsel uh, in Bill Clinton's White House Counsel's Office, and then joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., ultimately rising to become uh, deputy, uh, deputy, I guess, chief of the Enron Task Force, this little case called Enron. Fifteen years ago, Kathy was the prosecutor who delivered the closing argument at the Enron trial of Jeffrey Skilling and Kenneth Lay. That was seven, maybe 17 years ago, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, a long time ago. And after that, she returned to private practice in Latham, uh, but was recruited once again back into the Justice Department, where she served in the Obama administration for six years, uh, first as Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, I think they call that the pay dag, that's a very big job, um, and then being recruited over to the White House to serve ultimately as the White House Counsel in the Obama administration until 2014. And during her stint as White House Counsel, by all accounts, uh, Kathy became a key trusted advisor and counselor to President Obama on all manner of foreign and domestic policy, including helping to ensure that one of his signature achievements, uh, the Affordable Care Act legislation, was successfully upheld in the Supreme Court. So to sum it up, Kathy Rumler has somehow managed to have a career in which she's become one of our nation's most formidable trial lawyers and a uh, member of the American College of Trial Lawyers. She's held one of the most senior positions within the Justice Department. She's been the White House counsel. 
He's headed up the global practice of one of the world's largest and biggest white collar defense and investigations practice. She's the general counsel at Goldman Sachs. And it's, I think it's fair to say that Kathy Rumler is good at all of it, whatever it is. Um, so Kathy, we are so grateful to you for agreeing to accept this award tonight. We know that your participation helped immeasurably in making tonight uh, a record-breaking event for OAD. It enables OAD to provide the holistic defense that is so differentiating in what it does in keeping the clients uh, front and center. And so we are all incredibly grateful to you uh, for being here tonight and for accepting this award. Gosh, I listen to that and I feel like that woman cannot keep a job. Um, <laughs> it is, uh, it, thank you all for being here and it's such an honor to be here, particularly um, with Jim and Tony. And so thanks guys, you did a terrific job, even though I couldn't really keep you under control at all in my role as Chief Justice. Um, mostly I just want to say how much I admire the work of OAD. You know, um, it is often said that we have the best criminal justice system in the world in the U.S. and I having been um, a prosecutor and a defense attorney, I really believe that to be true, but it is very far from perfect, and investigators make mistakes, prosecutors make mistakes, defense lawyers make mistakes, judges make mistakes, and it's, it's the appellate defenders who um, keep us honest and, and go in and fix those mistakes, and so uh, the work that Caprice, you and your team do is just phenomenal, and so I was thrilled to, to help and be here to support all of that fantastic work. And uh, with that, I think we have a case to decide. <laughs> so please remain in your seats. The final act of tonight's program begins now, the mock Supreme Court's deliberation. Okay, let's see how we're gonna come out on this one. I think it's a bit of a nail biter. <laughs> um, Ron, let's start with you. Okay, well, colleagues, I would uh, vote to affirm uh, the First Circuit's opinion. Uh, it seems like there's two issues for us primarily to decide. First is whether we overrule uh, Grutter. Um, I don't think the petitioner has shown that it is egregiously wrong, which is what's required for us under our precedent to, to do that. I think I find most persuasive uh, the argument that was um, the point that was alluded to in the argument that the Congress that passed uh, the 14th Amendment also passed other race conscious uh, legislation. So I think even an originalist could reach that conclusion. Um, so I would I would uh, not overrule Grutter um, with respect to the second question about if we apply it. Is out what's required to satisfy strict scrutiny, um, that it's holistic, that it's just a plus factor, et cetera. It seems to me from the record that Harvard's um, policies pretty fairly track what Grutter's requirements are. Um, so I, I would uh, find that it satisfies strict, strict scrutiny. I, Please I would, proceed, Justice. <laughs> yes. I, I would also vote to affirm uh, the lower courts and uphold Harvard's uh, program. Um, but I would add that I found most persuasive uh, Mr. Rico's arguments about the nature of diversity and the values that these programs provide. Uh, and I think there's something very limiting about the way this court's precedents have required schools to say that their admissions policies provide for livelier discussion and you know, therefore are beneficial to the white students in order to uphold their program. So I would use this as an opportunity to revisit those precedents and maybe broaden the rationales on which we permit them to be, uh, to proceed. Um, thank you, Mr. Benjamin and Mr. Rico for your excellent advocacy. Um, 
I uh, had a, a case with Tony with you and Bruce McIntyre when I was uh, new AUSA, and I, it was my first, although unfortunately not my last time, forgetting to order the defendants to be produced by the marshals. And I realized on my walk down the alley to the courthouse, and when I walked in and apologized, expecting you both to uh, be furious, I was met with a demonstration of grace and kindness from you both that was a lesson I have not forgotten. Um, the uh, notion of colorblindness um, that Justice Harlan mentioned in his um, opinion in Plessy v. Ferguson, and which Mr. Benjamin alluded to, uh, is aspirational. and to the extent that it can ever be achieved, as Mr. Rico said, we are far, far from that point. Um, that, you know, deep inequities along racial lines still persist, and the goals of equal protection just cannot be achieved if we insist on a colorblind interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Diversity is a value uh, in and of itself. And we recognized as much when we held in Grutter um, that that is a compelling state interest sufficient to justify the use of race in admission decisions. Diverse perspectives, as the Grutter court noted, improve classroom discussion, help students develop as professionals, um, and the benefits go on. And that value is no less apparent today than it was almost 25 years ago. There is no race-neutral alternative that is workable, and Bruder was correctly decided. Um, stare decisis requires something much more than disagreement with its reasoning, and over 40 years of court precedent have recognized that race is a permissible consideration in college admissions and universities. Notwithstanding that permissible consideration, um, the lack of diversity, the lack of racial diversity in the pipeline of lawyers is apparent to all of us who practice today when looking at who the applicants are to our institutions and our law firms. Um, so the work is far from over. Whatever shortcomings exist in the program um, do not amount to egregious error in the First Circuit's decision. Because Harvard's admissions program complies with Grutter, it does not violate Title VI, and we should affirm. Madam? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and thank you to counsel on both sides for excellent arguments. Um, after trying to find the best good faith arguments on both sides, I, too, am compelled to conclude that the respondent has the stronger of the arguments in this case. I see no basis to reject the district court's clear findings or the First Circuit's endorsement of those findings. SFFA had voluminous discovery, 16 days in court, and 30 witnesses, and could not prove that Harvard engages in intentional discrimination against Asian American applicants, or white applicants for that matter. At most, I see that SFFA presents a statistical model which is heavily focused on the personal score, which is one factor of many. It seems to me that both sides are agreed that in the aggregate, Asian American applicants are assigned the lowest personal scores. I am troubled by that disparity and by the source and the significance of it. Petitioner asks this court to infer that pernicious anti-Asian American stereotyping is the cause of the disparity and that it results in harm to Asian American applicants in the outcome of the Harvard admissions process. However, there's insufficient evidence and insufficient reason for us to draw those conclusions. In sum, if the petitioner cannot show Harvard's intent to discriminate or an effect on admissions outcome, the petitioner simply does not have the evidence to prevail under this court's precedence. And because petitioner loses on precedent, it seeks to overturn it. I see no reason to do so. Gruder is not Plessy. 
I am not known to be a justice endeared to the approach of originalism, nor am I known to be a justice at all. However, <laughs> this evening, I will say that if originalism is at issue here, I find Harvard's position the more convincing. The Congress that passed the 14th Amendment also passed race-conscious legislation in order to promote equal protection under the law and to begin the work of undoing the racial caste system upon which this country was founded. Our precedents hold that race-conscious policies narrowly tailored are constitutionally permissible to work to undo that caste system, and the work is not yet done. The educational goal of diversity is consistent with and in service of that goal, and I would affirm the First Circuit on that basis. At the risk of bringing diversity to the decision making, uh, I'll, I'll also actually just go ahead and affirm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll try not to repeat what's been said. I think what was touching to me and what I appreciated from uh, Tony's argument uh, was the fact that what's embedded in, in the country sort of foundation is taking a chance on people. Uh, and I thought that was well said. And I, and I think he, he mentioned several examples of those chances uh, that worked out extremely well. Uh, and recognizing that the court doesn't make a decision in the vacuum, um, I think we've already seen the effects of getting rid of affirmative action in several states, uh, the University of California system perhaps being the biggest example. Uh, and, and I take what's happened there not to be good, and diversity has fallen, and I think the country and that state in particular is worse for it. Uh, and so I would also avert, uh, vote to affirm um, the lower court's decision. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, I think the real audience for this case in Washington is not the same as this bench. Um, so, at least to, to mix it up, um, I think what you're likely to hear from a 6-3 court is that, um, you know, that, that courts should not be in the business of policing how much race can count as a factor in a, as, or as a gateway to admission. Um, and I, I think you'll hear that telling universities that they may consider race, but that race cannot be a defining feature in an admission standard, which is the current law, that that's just not workable. The reality is that what it, what it ends up doing is encouraging universities to consider race with sort of a wink and a nod. It's not a quota, it's not the defining standard, but it's something that we actually really think about and are doing it as, as quietly as we can. And I, 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 like, I think the court is likely to say that, um, that what Brown counseled and what, what Jim Benjamin started with, which is that you know, race cannot be used as a factor in affording educational opportunities, that you can't square that with allowing colleges to do what Harvard has done here. Um, and there is a real competing value to what Justice Boone put out about trying to elevate uh, people across the country. There's a competing value of telling universities and institutions across the country that you just can't talk about and, and, and can't consider race as one factor. Um, well, I'm sure my colleague Andrew is right, as he usually is. Um, I'm going to return to the happy little bubble of this evening. <laughs> <laughs> and also vote to affirm um, a bubble created largely by um, the terrific arguments from Tony and Jim. Um, and I think I would affirm because of a strength of Harvard's case and a, and a weakness of the petitioners. You know, I think the strength, it really is the compelling goal that diversity is for all the reasons they identify in terms of training leaders and better educating students and probably, as Dan said, for many other reasons that, that deserve more recognition and more acknowledgement in the law. Um, and because, you know, in reading the petitioner's case, it, it, it just was hard to see the, the distance from reality, right, and the failure to grapple with the world that we really live in. Um, 
And so for those two reasons, I would also affirm. So um, I will also vote to affirm uh, a happy live in a bubble. Um, but more than that, I am a graduate of the University of Michigan undergrad and the University of Texas School of Law. And for most of my professional life, my two amazing universities have been battling it out in the Supreme Court defending um, the compelling interest of diversity in higher education. And so I'm just glad that now it's Harvard's turn, although I fear <laughs> that Harvard has mucked it up and with their TIP system. Um, so I do worry, and I think that uh, the prognostication about a reversal is the right one. I think um, reading the tea leaves, it's likely to be that the Supreme Court um, rejects the idea of diversity um, and the benefits that flow from it as a compelling interest. I think we're going to see a narrowing of what compelling interests are. Um, that concerns me a great deal because I too, um, I think anyone who has been in um, the rarefied world of the law that we exist in uh, is familiar with what it is like to be in a room that is not diverse and the limitations on the discussions that follow and the, you know, what it is like by contrast, to be in a room with people from diverse backgrounds and particularly racial diversity. Um, so I, for those reasons, um, you know, I'm a little heartbroken to that this is just a bubble, um, but uh, grateful to the opportunity, for the opportunity to be here and, and thank counsel for your great arguments and to my fellow justices. Well. <laughs> Given that this is a rare a moment of consensus among the court, um, I'm going to invoke my prerogative as Chief Justice and assign the opinion to myself. And uh, it'll be short and sweet and nine zip in favor of Harvard. And I, I'm just, I'm counting you as an affirm even, because you were just kind of plain devil's <laughs> advocate. Um, and with that, Caprice, I think that's a wrap. So I know. I know we've held you a little bit longer than we expected, but thank you for hanging in there. Thank you to the advocates and all the justices. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next year, October 2nd, 2023. It will be our 30th annual event, but it will be OAD's 35th anniversary, so I hope to see you all then. Good night, everybody. Thank you.